Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the 368th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. Um, this is a um, weekly uh, reading series with people who make comics, people who um, write about comics, think about comics, presenting. Um, and if you're not, if you're coming in and you're not muted, um, please take upon yourself to mute yourself so that we uh, we can focus on Kevin when he comes on the screen. So this is a weekly reading series of, of people doing free form presentations about um, a subject of their choosing. Uh, it was founded a decade ago by uh, cartoonist and educator Ben Catcher. My name's Austin English. I'm uh, co-curating this season with Ben, Bill Cardalopoulos, and Lily Carre. Um, I am really, really excited for tonight's guest, Kevin Huizenga. Um, I'll say a little bit at the top about my experience with Kevin's work. When I was first getting into mini comics um, and alternative comics, art comics, however you, you want to talk about them, this this mini comic, Super Monster 11, I've been carrying this with me from apartment to apartment, and it was sent to me in the mail. And I think I must have been, uh, maybe I just turned 16 when I, when I got this. And I remember being so drawn to it. Um, I couldn't. I don't think I was ready to understand what was in it, and I can't claim to fully understand Kevin's work yet. But it really, it really um, drew me in, and I tried, I tried to struggle with it. And then this issue of Super Monster, which came a little bit later, Super Monster number twelve. I think I and everyone who was um, uh, reading maybe these mini comics in this very um, small scene of people that were very interested in this. I think this publication had such a profound effect. I know it had a profound effect on me and I think so many other people. And I am still, um, I could spend a lot of time babbling about what this comic meant to me or what I think it means. But really what I can say is that it affected me emotionally, intellectually, and it imprinted on me this belief in what this medium can achieve just on paper, self-published. This was just such a um, such a beautiful, moving work of art to me. And I think I'm still affected by, I believe this came out in 2000. And um, I've never lost this standard for, for what this medium can do. And Kevin would go on to publish this mini comic as well that, that had a similar effect on me and has gone on to um, make work that many more people might be familiar with, including uh, Ganges and many other publications. So um, again, part of the reason that I wanted Kevin to participate in this is that I find it very hard to do justice to, to Kevin's work when I'm speaking about it. So it'll be nice to hear from Kevin in his own words. Um, and it'll be nice to have people in the audience be able to ask Kevin questions um, that they might have about his work. And that's part of what the symposium is supposed to be about, a unity between audience and speaker. So if you have a question, do not hesitate to ask it. You can type it into the chat while Kevin's speaking. Um, I can call on you and you can read it out loud if you like, and you indicate that, or you can just have me read it. It's up to you. I am going to read a very quick um, bio of Kevin, and then I will kick things over to him. Uh, Kevin Heizenga is a cartoonist responsible for Glenn Gange's comics, The River at Night, Comic School USA, and other books. He lives in Chicago. Here is Kevin Heizenga. Oh, I think you have to unmute, Kevin. Hello, hello, everybody. Good. Um, thank you, Austin, uh, for that introduction and for having me. Um, and thanks to everybody else, uh, Ben and Lily and, and Bill. Um, and thank you to everyone for showing up and being in the audience. Um, I will share my screen. It was such an intimate moment. Okay. So, um, um, I'm going to talk about my recent work. At, at first, I would I told Austin I would talk about my recent work sort of as a way to punt a little bit because I didn't really have anything planned. Um, but I'm really going to talk about my recent work. Um, Kevin, I, I hate to interrupt you right at the beginning. Someone in the no, chat please. is just asking if you can uh, just increase the volume just a little bit. I can hear you uh, fine, but maybe just, just a touch louder. 
um, in the settings? Do I do I increase something in the settings? Is that what um, I think? Like, remember what you did before when we were like before we started? I think just with your um, I know I could hear you better then. Um, I can hear you fine now, but but I, someone in the chat is just asking if you could increase the volume just a little bit. I I can't increase okay. it anymore on my end. I, I'll I'll. Once I'm uh, sharing the screen, I don't see where the settings is. So I'm okay. looking around for the settings. Maybe I'll stop sharing the set the screen. Thank um, you. I'll look for the settings, uh, preferences, audio. All right, I increased the input level a bit and I'll try to talk, I'll try to project a little bit better. I can hear you right? a lot better now. Melanie, is that better for you? Is that working all right? I'm just seeing the, oh, better. Okay, great. So we're okay. ready to go. Thank you, Kevin. All right. <clears throat> um, so now, okay, share the screen. Uh, share the screen. Go back to the thing. Close this. All right, are we good? Uh, you can see the thing. All right. Reason work. <clears throat> what am I doing? This is a question I ask myself a lot. In the mornings, I, it feels like my memory was wiped overnight and I sit down again and I'm like, what am I doing again? Um, I'm trying to draw comics. I'm trying to focus at, or concentrate. Um, this is literally what I did this morning, recent work. Um, I taught yesterday, you know, my mind was fried. Um, I had this I had this page with some panel borders drawn already for some other project, but I never did it. So I sat down and I just like free associated and started putting things in panels really to get myself to warm up, to do some real work. I'm kind of in between stories right now. I'm in between issues. And when I'm, I don't have a specific thing that I'm working on, I, I, I'll play around like this. Uh, and I'm playing around on the, the normal size paper that I usually work on. But um, as you'll see, it's like, it's difficult to get to this point. But anyway, that's what I did this morning. This is the most recent work. <laughs> um, and this weekend, I'm going to be in Portland. Um, and I'm going to be signing at Floating World with uh, Sammy Harkum and Zach Sally. So I just wanted to put that announcement right at the beginning um, and get that, um, make sure I got to it. Recent work, what am I doing? <clears throat> uh, as I was writing this, trying to put this slideshow together, I drew this little comic. Um, I really think it's this, it's true that like whatever I turn my attention to ends up sort of feeling infinite. It's like I, I turn my attention to this and then pretty soon it becomes this huge project and a body of work. And then I turn my, you know, and so it's almost becomes, it's almost dangerous sometimes to, to turn my attention to something and I have to be very careful and I have to constantly be like pushing myself, like, like focus on this, focus on this. Don't get distracted. <clears throat> it's a struggle. As I was putting this slideshow together last week <clears throat> on Wednesday, uh, my two terabyte external hard drive where most of my stuff is um, stored stopped uh, responding it just kept spinning the uh, beach ball you know of death and so all my slides all my slides from previous presentations etc are all on this external hard drive and um i'm usually pretty good about backing up i've always had a cloud backup i've backed up things off and on over the years like every once in a while somebody will say back up your data and I'll think like there's that's right I should do that anyways I was playing with fire this thing was not backed up so anyways that happened last Wednesday as I'm putting the slideshow together it sort of affected the situation so I'll come back to that <clears throat> um so suddenly work became a uh, find out about data recovery in Chicago. So I'm on Reddit and I'm on the internet and I'm talking to people I know in Chicago about data recovery and getting estimates and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, recent work, this is my uh, bullet journal. 
this is, uh, you know, if you know about bullet journaling, it's a certain kind of productivity system. I started doing it last year, kind of got into it. This is my bullet journal. I use it a lot. I won't go into the whole philosophy of it. On the inside cover, there's an index that shows you like the projects and what pages they're, you know, they're on. Um, I'm just showing this because this is one of the many things that uh, is constantly like um, in my in my life when I'm like, what am I doing? Here's as you can see, there's a little thumbnail of of curses. Uh, I'm my old book, curses. I did a soft cover uh, with drawn and quarterly that'll come out early next year. I worked a lot on that last year. Um, some of that stuff is here in this bullet journal. Of course, what happens, you know, as a cartoonist, you, your to-do lists become, have little drawings on them. And then you just, you, you don't even really want to work on the to-do list. You want to work on the drawing and then, you know, so my, my to-do lists over the years have gotten more and more ornate and there's doodles and drawings all over them. And then the, I'll also mention in passing that I did lose this bullet journal for a few months uh, last this, you know, at the end of the summer. So that's also the danger that happens is you put all your info in one place and then you misplace it. And then, then what do you, you know, what do you got? Um, so anyways, okay. So I'm working on this slideshow and I draw this little comic here at the left um, about what, how I feel. <clears throat> And then I draw this other little, I don't know if you can see my, can you see my cursor? Yeah. I draw this because I draw this and then I think this isn't good. Nothing about this is good or appealing. And then I draw this where I like, again, what am I doing? And then here it's like, yeah, that's the classic setup. Lately, I've been drawing myself as just this, this simple thing. And then I just write me on the, on the, the uh, t-shirt and here I have someone saying, I love how you draw yourself. And then I say, I'm drawing bad on purpose, you idiot. And then, and then I ended up drawing more over here. The point of this being like, I should be working on this slideshow, but I don't wanna work on this slideshow. So I'm in my bullet journal, I'm doodling this comic and then I'm thinking like, oh, maybe I can put this in the slide, but I'm also kind of avoiding the work. <clears throat> it's part of the larger point I, this slideshow is about, which is that like, it's hard to focus on one thing. And sometimes when I'm focusing on that, I end up doing something to the side of it. And then that becomes a thing. And then pretty soon it's like, what do I do then? I, do I work on that more? Do I do something else? Here I'm thinking about, um, you know, dollars. And I'm thinking about how I'm going to have to pay for this data recovery. And I'm thinking about maybe I should have a sale, you know, like a, a original art. I could call it the data recovery sale or something. And I'm thinking like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I should do that. No, I don't want to do that. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So I forced myself to sit and draw for a while. Anyways, <clears throat> I also point out that I wrote in, I wrote September 30, but it wasn't September 30, it was September 20. I don't even know what I'm doing, getting the numbers wrong. So anyways, um, going backwards, for years now, I've made these little uh, booklets. They're they're like this size. I don't know if you can see them on the screen. You know, they're like this size. They're basically just scrap paper, and I staple them together like a mini comic. And in the old days, I would put the word focus on the cover because they were, and I called them my focus books, because the idea was that when I start my day, I'm going to sit down with one of these little booklets. And that's the one thing I know that I'm going to do. And I, and I think on paper and I try to have a to-do list and I kind of have a continuity of what I'm doing. And so I made these little focus books. And then over the years I've made, I don't know how many, but like many tens of them. Um, when I had a, like a moment of crisis back in like 2018, I did this in my apartment where I laid out a lot of my work to look at and I laid it out in vertical um, columns by year. And you can see right here where the red circle is, is where I started doing making these little focus books. And then they started to, there started to be more and more and more of them <clears throat> um, around, 
here I switched to these notebooks and then I started using these notebooks a lot for uh, years. Um, but lately, this is what the focus books will look like. You know, it's just doodling sketchbooks, but it's also to do lists and uh, sometimes uh, just free writing and trying to get my head straight. You know, I'm trying to get my head and my hand and my like my heart and my spirit, like all sort of like in the same place at the same time. So I know what I'm doing. Again, this is what they sort of look like. This is from way back. This is from, I don't know, 2010 or something. Nowadays, I often in the morning, the first thing I do is I sit down at this little study carol I got, you know, it's like a school library study carol, which is great because it's, you know, it's like very easy to focus within this little desk with these little walls. And I read a bit in the morning. And um, at some point, you know, in some lull in my spirit, I was like, all I want to do is read, you know, so a day where I read for a couple hours is such a happy day. So I was like, why don't I just start my day reading for a couple hours. <clears throat> and so for a while, that's what I would do, I would sit and read. Um, and I started making these little books, these little um, notebooks that I called F book notes, um, where I would basically read and then I would like take little notes and do little doodles, sort of like to keep myself focused, but also to like, you know, do that thing when you take notes and like it, there's a better chance that it's going to like have purchase in your mind, in your memory. Um, and I, I really just started making these booklets, not with any plan, but the reading in the morning and drawing in these little notebooks became such a like favorite part of my day. Um, and then of course it becomes a thing, right? It's like, so I, I, I made it an Instagram account and I basically post like four pages a day, a little bit less nowadays, but um, it's an, it's an Instagram account. And um, I don't know why, like, I don't care about the likes, but it's also like a nice little routine. Um, it makes one feel a little bit less alone to post and then get a couple likes, you know, but um I'm, I just started booklet, I think 56. Um, and I just started this, I don't know when I started it, but it's been less than two years. Um, so I, at this point I'm making almost like three or four booklets a month. Um, and again, and so this is what they look like, you know, and I'm not trying hard. I'm kind of playing around in the morning. I'm drinking coffee. I'm like, you know, little phrases or words that are funny to me or whatever, I, I make notes of them. But then of course I'm like, should I do, you know, what happens is like this thing that I'm doing purely gratuitously, purely for the joy of it, purely for its own sake. I keep thinking like, should I do something? Should I make these into little booklets? Should I print these? You know, and then it becomes a project where it's like, do I have to scan, do I have to scan these and then put them in InDesign? And I, I, I experimented with that, but then while I was working on it, I was like, why am I wasting my time on this? Like nobody, like the world does not need my like ridiculous scrawl notes. Like, it's not like this is gonna be a project that pays for itself or anything like that. But um, that's one of the things I do in the morning. Um, at a certain point, I try to do about an hour, hour and a half, two hours. And then, I, then I'm like, you gotta go into the studio and do some work. But um, this is what they look like. Um, I added some tones to the to these because these were going to be put in print. And you know, there's so many of them at this point. Um, I really only have them in my f uh, phone and on Instagram um, with photos, so they're not. You know, it's like it would be a huge project to sit and try to scan these all. I think. Well, should I do that? But then I'm like, no. <clears throat> on and on and on and on. This is a little picture I found in a book that I, you know, I grab books from the free free library and stuff and I hear I did a little drawing of it here. Um, so yeah, so then again, this becomes a project. It becomes a, a big thing. It's, it's something that's helping me focus, but uh, it's increasing my like quality of life, but 
so okay so i dropped the hard drive off at the at the data recovery place it's a two-hour round trip to the to palatine illinois um i drop it off with the guy um i wait a few days he emailed me yesterday and says it's gonna be 800 bucks he thinks he can get all the data sounds good go ahead with that um what are you gonna do the lesson learned i guess and everyone in this room you know please learn the lesson like back up your stuff um so i think okay 800 bucks all right i'll have a little art sale you know i'll 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 sell some work you know i'm always thinking about that anyway but now i got a good excuse to do it as i'm drawing comics i i'm often tracing on copy paper to get the drawings right and then i trace them back on the bristol so I have a lot of pages that look like this, where it's like, they're kind of cool looking and they're almost finished looking, but this isn't the actual comic. This is me like, you know, when I'm inking, sometimes I have to fool myself into drawing. I have to fool myself into thinking this isn't the actual drawing. This is just a practice drawing. And so I'm tracing and like trying out the, the forms. But then I end up with a lot of copy sheets like this. And so I think, oh, is this, maybe I can sell these. Is pe are people interested in these? But of course I have like a ton of them in the studio. And one thinks like, should I, I, I should keep this uh, nice or should I go through this and sort this? Or should I pull out the ones that are nice for selling? And then, you know, it becomes another big project. Um, this is an example. These two pages, on these are the original pages on the right, these two pages. And then this is kind of like, a selection of all the things that went into making those pages, like the the studio shrapnel of creating those panels, um, either doodling or like working on a drawing and then tracing it and retracing it and retracing it until I get it right. Um, and so when I, I did sell these two pages and then I threw in all the studio stuff with it, and then I was like, oh, maybe that'll be a thing that I'll do. So I try to, you know, suddenly now I have to try to keep that all organized. Um, but it's it's worth it. You know, it's it's cool. Um, so, okay, so now it's Thursday. I'm working on this slideshow on Wednesday. It's, it's Thursday. Um, I'm thinking like, should I work more on the slideshow or should I work on my comic book? Fielder number three is what really I should be working on. Um, but I also have um, a class coming up on Monday. So I got really got to think about class. So what we have, you know, what we have here is a screenshot of my InDesign welcome screen. And what I'm saying here is like, again, in the morning when I'm like, what am I doing? One of the first things I do, try to do is open up InDesign because like InDesign is kind of like where all my projects live and it's like a good home base because I can just like put pages in the comic book, put pages in the book or um, whatever it might be. There's, the, you know, InDesign has this thing at the top that says, when in doubt, make a layout. And I, it, I have to say, I you know, I kind of live by that. Uh, motto too. I think it's a good motto. And I, I um, so anyways, this is, you know, my welcome screen. And I'm just pointing out here that like within 10 days, these are all the Instagram or all the uh, InDesign documents I had had open and had been working on. Um, this is, this is a screenshot of all the InDesign documents from a year from 2023. Um, just to show, you know, that I, that's, that's where I live a lot of times. That's the first thing I open up in the morning. Um, this here on the right is a good example of like, again, like trying to think on paper and make a to-do list about what, I, what am I doing? What am I working on? Here, I think I'm thinking a lot about the Curses soft cover. And then I'm also thinking about um, class because this is, a, this is, before class started, I teach uh, intro to comics at school, the Art Institute, uh, Chicago, and um, I, of course, like I was having that like late summer panic where I'm like, what am I gonna do again? Like, what am I gonna thinking like week one we'll do this and blah 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 blah. And you know, it's 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 ridiculous. 
the thing that I'll show here is that like these boxes are the boxes of the same size that I draw my comics. So I'm like, I'm making these boxes the same size, which is like 10 centimeters by 15 centimeters. That's kind of like my basic go-to panel size. So sometimes I'll just sit down and make 10 centimeter by 15 centimeter boxes, just because it's like, I feel comfortable in that size and I should be, I should be thinking in that size anyway. Um, this is to show that like, even though I'm in InDesign, now that that external hard drive is busted, every time I open an InDesign document, it says, oh, all the links are missing because all those files were on that external hard drive. So that's a problem. Um, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this, I'm going to do this slideshow for Austin. Um, what's a good amount of slides? Maybe 30 slides. I don't know. That's like, We'll see. So I start throwing together all these slides in InDesign. And of course, like before you know it, I end up with, I don't even know, you know, it's like 86, 88 slides. And I'm like, that's not going to work. If I talk for a minute a slide, that's way too much time. I'm going to talk 30 seconds, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so here we go, you know, onward. Um, Here's some recent work. So this is from earlier this year, uh, around the time of my birthday in March, I was like, I'd like to do a poetry zine. You know, I write in, I write and letter in my sketchbooks all the time. And sometimes I just like write things that I guess you could call poems. You know, I don't think of myself as a poet or someone who's writing poems, but it's, you know, I have to face it. It is what I do uh, sometimes. And so I was like, I'll just get together all these things in my sketchbook that are kind of poem-like um, and I'll put together a zine. So I put together the zine non-prose and sent that to my uh, Patreon su subscribers. These are the other zines uh, and prints that I've made for the Patreon subscribers this year and last year. Um, I make these zines and then I bundle some of the ones together and I sell them. Um, down here is a print that, uh, uh, seems silk screen print, um, this is fielder number two, the cover for the subscriber edition. Fielder number two should be out by now, but I'm still waiting for it to show up at the dock from China, um, hopefully any day now. But this is a comic book that I been, was working on for a while. This is my book, River at Night. Um, I broke fielder two up into different smaller zines that I sent to my uh, my Patreon subscribers. This is a picture of those there. Um, it helped me get it done because I could like set these little deadlines and get the little zine done, send it out to subscribers, you know. This is ostensibly what I'm really working on, which is Fielder Michiana, which is the next Glenn Ganges book. This is a double page spread from the, you know, the opening. Uh, this is a screenshot of all the emails of all the printers because I made the decision to self-publish Fielder 2. And I didn't really know what I, I didn't have a printer lined up. So I talked to all these different printers and I talked to publishers to see about, you know, because of course, like I needed to figure out how much it was going to cost and who was going to be the best, et cetera. But it was a lot of work doing all these emails and keeping track of all the math. Here's uh, a bunch of the pages from Fielder 2. So this is the main thing, you know, this is what I should be working on all the time. For whatever reason, I get distracted from this all the time. I'm in my sketchbook, I'm in my notebooks, I'm playing around with this, I'm playing around with that. But this, you know, this is the Glenn Ganges uh, uh, sequel uh, series that I'm doing. And then I did this other, small um, story called The Body of Work Keeps the Score, which is uh, some of these pages on the bottom here. Um, so there you go. Uh, one of the other projects that's going on is teaching. And I taught for a while in 2015 through 2019. And then I took some time off. And now I'm back, just uh, like Rodney Dangerfield. And 
so I'm back uh, teaching at the Art Institute. And when I teach, it's the same sort of thing where it's like, I don't really know how to approach it without making a zine in InDesign. So yeah, at MCAT in Minneapolis, I made these zines for the students and then I bundled them together as this series called Comic School USA. Um, and then going to this new class, it's the same thing where I was like, the only way I can think about this class is making a zine. Um, so I make them uh, zines about various topics. There's week one, there's week two. Week two is really just a lot of that Richard Taylor book. Um, great book, uh, Introduction to Cartooning. Uh, week three, you know, was me planning. Um, week three, while we're planning this slideshow, uh, we ended up talking about uh, lettering. It wasn't really the plan, but we ended up talking about lettering. Um, we had Dean Sidarsky, who does um, a lot of the lettering for the New York Review of Comics, you know, like matching the fonts, matching the lettering styles of the different translated comics as a guest. Um, and then, but then I'm, as the, the cover of the zine was my, my external hard drive, because that's what I was thinking about. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna quickly run through some of the stuff about the what I do for the Patreon, and then we'll, I won't go on and on and on with these slides. <clears throat> So I have a Patreon. I try to make, every month I make a, what I call an electronic magazine. It's called F for focus. Um, I try to make it every, you know, again, it's in InDesign. I have InDesign open. I'm just dropping stuff in InDesign all month. And then at the end of the month, I kind of wrap it up and make a cover and upload that as a PDF. Um, it ends up I shoot for 32 pages, but it ends up sometimes being like 60 pages if I end up throwing a bunch of sketchbook stuff in there. It's a lot of sketchbook stuff, but it's also comics. Here's a bunch of the covers. Here's more of the covers. Excuse me. Um, more of the covers. And what, here's some of what it looks like on the inside. Like here's a sketch I did of that big fielder opening. Um, I put that in there. Here's a, when I lived in Minneapolis, here's my uh, studio part of my apartment. Put that in there. Some more studio shots. Um, some more of, some more of what the, uh, is in a zine. I write about stuff. I put links to various things I'm working on or links to things that might be interesting. Here's a couple more covers. Um, I worked on this four pager for the volume two of the Popeye Sundays for Fanographics. And so I did this little like, uh, comics essay about Wimpy that was, I was working on that last year. Um, so I put like a lot of the process stuff from there into the, into the e-zines. Here's what it looked like, uh, when it was done. Um, these are not even comics pages, but like they're what I'm talking about where like sometimes I sit down and I'm, I try to fool myself into working on comics pages by like, by like free associating on a page that sort of already has panels and stuff on it. And I, I'm already sort of doing some lettering. And so it's like warming up the, the machine. And sometimes I'm, I'm taking a first, uh, first draft at something that's going to go into the comic. Um, here again is like a, a page of the Glen Ganges comics, but then on a separate piece of paper, I'm kind of like working out the, the poses. Um, and this one looks particularly clean <laughs> and good. So, uh, I included that and I use that as a cover. Um, and again, you know, I'll, I'll quit pretty quick here. This is, I was also working on the curse of soft cover, um, last year. And so. There was a lot of production work on the Curse of Soft cover. Uh, and I put a lot of that stuff in the easing uh, along the way. Um, I put notes in the back of the, you know, <laughs> I, I did a thing that, you know, I was totally self-indulgent. I was like, yeah, let me tell you about everything that went into this book. So I made these um, notes for the back of the book and 
the first draft of those notes went into the e-zines um, and then it changed, you know, and went into the book in a different form. But like the first draft was in the e-zines and it ended up being a lot more of it where I was like, blah, 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 blah. And then later I was like, I don't want to have all this in the book, so I'll cut it out. Um, you know, like here's my reference photos from way back in 2002 when I was doing a story about like a gross suburban sprawl uh, area. And so I took all these reference photos of Grand Rapids uh, out in the Beltline uh, of Grand Rapids. Um, notes and sketches from Jeepers Jacobs, which is one of the stories and curses, and so on. Originally, there was going to be some stories about Adam and Eve in Curses, and I had this whole thing with Adam and Eve, but I ended up cutting that, but then I kind of brought it back for some of the, the notes in the back. And so this is what the pages look like in the actual Curses book after the process of working on the notes for a while. Um, and, you know, putting these all together in InDesign. Um, and I'm going to hit there. I hit the slide. It says the end. So I'm going to make that the end. Um, I'm happy to talk about whatever. If anyone has any questions or disagreements or anything they want to hash out. Well, thank you, Kevin. I, I've I've noted down a bunch of questions um, and I'm going to just I'm going to limit myself to a couple to start things off um, so that other people get a chance. But kind of the first thing that kind of came up to me hearing you talk about this stuff is I think about how maybe peers of yours might um, do autobiog autobiographical comics about maybe a relationship, maybe a health event that happens, something like that. And it almost occurs to me watching you do this presentation that maybe, and it, this is what I want to know, how much you'd agree with this assessment of what you're doing, what it might, what this assessment might miss, what might be accurate. If your autobiography has something to do with activity, cataloging activity, maybe the activity of your mind, activity of actions you need to complete, um, would it, does that sound accurate to you? Like an autobiography about about what you do, not not what you, not the, not melodrama or necessarily personal details, but about what your the way your mind is moving and the things that you're you're doing. Um... You're asking like, rather than uh, a straightforward story or like a straightforward sort of autobiographical approach, there's... Yeah, like, I mean, at first I was gonna say like with Glenn Gange's maybe there's, maybe there's like naturalistic fiction happening, but to me those, it always seems more about expressing, it always seems more ideas first the arc of fiction second. And then in looking at all these zine projects you have, it seems to be about you. I mean, it is it is your activity, your fo you focusing, cataloging process, um, all these things, but it's a different kind of autobiography than I think most people do. Um, and I'm wondering if someone was to, if someone was trying to summarize this aspect of your project and they said, it's an autobiography of, activity and the mind's activity, what they might be missing with that assessment and what might be accurate? Um, I, I think I think it's right to say that like, I'm interested in like stream of consciousness and like, um, you know, especially with the Glen Ganges River at Night stuff, um, I'm, I was interested in showing mental processes and trying to like, use comics forms to like you know I'm, I'm interested in like making comics that aren't like movies on paper or like animated storyboards on paper i like i want to do i want to use like the powers of comics to go in in interesting places and um and at least a lot of times maybe it's you know it, it, the focus is inward on the mind. Um, 
I'm not, I've never been interested really in being like about me personally and like analyzing me and like turning myself into a cartoon character and, you know, uh, a comedian who's like, you know, Seinfeld show or, you know, or something like that version of comics. Um, but I am interested in stream consciousness and, the, and I, over the years I've become much more indulgent of like just improvising on paper. When I was younger, I kind of tried to plan ahead and write a script and do a lot of pre-production, I guess. And more and more, I'm just kind of like, I like to just sit down and, you know, with even with some of these new pages, um, like I left in the, the panels where I and warming up, you know, like I left in a panel that says like warm up, you know, where I'm just kind of warming up the pen and uh, practicing. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, activity, I don't know. <laughs> well, um, I think, I think I'm, I think I am interested in fiction more and I wish I, I wish I were writing more focused short stories that were their own thing. When I was starting out, I really didn't work in a sketchbook at all. That's not true. I sort of worked in a sketchbook. It was all, but it was all in the service of the comic that I was working on at the time. And it's like most of my drawing energy went into the actual pages of comics. And somewhere along the line, and again, I think it's this focus book thing. It's like somewhere along the line, it like got diverted into sketchbooks and notebooks. And I'm often thinking about like, how do I get back to like, like the default is working on a page of comics rather than the d default is sort of like doodling and making a to-do list. <laughs> Scott H. Spencer asks, um, says, I saw the word meditation. Is meditation a part of your process? Yeah, for sure. It's a huge, uh, it's, it, life-changing like important thing for me it didn't it came from it came from productivity though it came from you know when i quit my job in i quit my day job foolishly <laughs> and then like had a you know mental collapse where i was just like what am i doing you know i suddenly was like i gotta learn about how to be a productive worker and so I sort of looked into the world of productivity in the in the mid 2000s and you know learned about all kinds of other tricks and whatever about productivity but um in that world you know one of the other kind of things was like um people were like I meditate and here's how I learned about it and so I just like started learning about it and it you know it took me a long way into the there's a lot to learn but like, you know, if we're talking about what we're talking about now, which is like me sitting down in the morning being like, what am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, one of the one of the best ways to, to handle that is to just sit still <laughs> and not do anything for a while. And then eventually you'll, you know, you, eventually it'll become clear, <laughs> hopefully. You know, I think as a cartoonist, you, I've often thought like, am I meditating on paper? Like, am I Am I like, you know, of course they talk about meditative drawing. I'm, I'm into that. You know, like, I think it's really a beautiful thing to be into like meditative drawing where it's just flowing and it's just, it's its own thing. Um, especially cartoonists, but um, anyways, I don't remember where I'm going with that, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an important thing for me. There's, there's two questions I want to get to in the chat, but I just want to, I, I want to build on that that response for a second because you know you're talking about meditative drawing and it it brings up this thing that I also was struck by in your talk where I just kind of wanted to know how much okay meditation is a part of your process what about preservation because like there's meditation where you're sitting silently and you're not you're not preserving anything it's just you you're you're maybe preserving your thinking and referring back to it but you're not necessarily documenting that and I think there's something I've noticed with your the the way that you're producing zines where it's preserving a lot of things. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's part of your process or if that's important to you, preservation. Preservation. 
like you mean like maybe like archiving my own self well yeah i mean there's things where you were like and here's some i mean it, it kind of just crystallized for me as you were talking about this because i've you know i have so many of your zines from and it's like you know drawings that contribute to something notes for a class you had photos preserved and in this talk you know a, a big part of it is that you've lost some data in your hard drive and then yeah. processing that. And I- It's also I, freeing in a way. I didn't really talk about that, but there's moments where I think like, maybe this is a new chapter in my life. Like, you know, I lost the last three years of my work and I'm free now, you know? <laughs> yes. But he, but then, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but no, no, no. But then you have to document the, you have to preserve thinking about the moment of losing that, you know, in this talk, I think it's very beautiful, like documenting the process of recovering. So I'm just, yeah, I'm just curious if that occurs to you or if that's something that, that maybe isn't so important, but it seems important to me. I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, there's some cartoonists, right. Who like, will you know, burn through a bunch of drawings and then just like get, get rid of it. And, or, you know, you buy it, you can just buy it, or they'll just be like, I'll give it to you for free, or they'll just be like, I threw away all these notebooks because I want to start fresh. Um, I, I definitely throw away a lot of stuff. Um, I think, I think I have a sense that I like, I always want to be putting something out. Like I, I feed on other cartoonist energy for sure. Like I just feed on other cartoonists I like who their work. And then I feel like I want to feed back into that, that energy exchange. And so I'm just always like, I'm just going to put stuff out, you know, put stuff out, put stuff out. And so um, I think sometimes I dig into old material to just have something to put out, you know, um, that makes sense. making a PDF every month for Patreon is, is pretty, satisfying to me i think that's what i wanted when i was younger i just wanted to have like a regular magazine that it was just coming out and um it's so much easier to go straight from indesign to a pdf to through the internet um than it is to like print it and distribute it and so on and so forth of course it's easier but you know i also want to do that too i want you know i do i'm also printing a lot of stuff and sending it out as well. Um, I think I also, you know, early on in my journey or whatever, I learned that lesson of like not reinventing the wheel. And so I'm always trying to kind of like take something that's already there and then like make something that's, you know, repetition with variation, you know, kind of thing. And then it, it evolves into a new thing. So I don't know. Well, we can use, we can ask a follow up on that from Jonathan Bass. And he says, um, Hi, Kevin. Uh, can, hi, can Kevin say more about the importance of InDesign for his work? Um, or I keep talking about InDesign. They got to, they got to give me a sponsorship. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like it's, it's, a, you could talk about it being like a container. It's not just InDesign itself, but it's the idea of a container. I've always been really attracted to the idea of having a series and then just putting things, you know, put some stuff in this issue and then whatever doesn't fit in this issue, put it in the next issue and and then on and on and on. And then that's what you do. That's your container. When I was younger and I had Super Monster was my mini comic series you know, I was inspired by John P's King Cat, you know, it was like King Cat um, and all the other solo anthologies that were around, but like, I was especially inspired by King Cat where, where it was like, issue 45, issue 46, issue 47, issue 48, you know, it's just like a container for all his thoughts and his world and, you know, his poetry and his jokes and his like, can you believe this happened to me? And like, you know, here's the classic rock albums I've been listening to lately, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think over time, my, I've, it's been scattered, like I, I've scattered all over the place and I'm always trying to bring it back to like one kind of container. And like, <clears throat> the other, I mean, the other thing I'll say about InDesign is that um, I have a copy, a photocopier and a bookmaker 
here in the in the compound. And um, so I'm able to like print out the zine and look at it and like mark it up. Like, you know, it's also very important for me to see it at size. So like, you know, this is, this is like Fielder 2. This isn't like the printed one. This is like one I made at home, but it's stapled, you know, and I sit and I mark it up and then I make the changes and then I print out another one, you know, it's a constant, even though I make these electronic zines, I also print them out and look at them, you know, as booklets too and mark them up. It's a big part of my process. I call it hold the book in your hand. Like I'm always trying to print out the book at size, look at it, mark it up, fix it in the computer, make another physical copy of it. So that's part of the it's part of what take, took me a long time with curses and river at night and stuff too, is that like, you know, like here, here's the curses soft cover. This is like, but like I'm printing it out and like looking at it at size and, and you know, that's part of the in design process too. Generoso asks, um, thanks so much for your presentation, Kevin. My favorite story from curses is 28th street. And I'm curious about your inspiration for it. Uh, 28th Street was 28th Street in Grand Rapids, uh, which is like a, a big Beltline road that has a ton of like malls and strip malls. And it's um, near Calvin, you know, college, Calvin University. That's where I went to college. Um, but I also was inspired by uh, folk tales. And I was just looking for a way to like mix together, like talking about suburban sprawl and like car-based urban planning with like um you know i thought it would be ridiculous to also have that be sort of like a folk folk tale like fetch quest sort of structure where like the character has to go get this magical item and then that leads to this magical item and so on and so forth um i know lots of other things went into it too but the, the, the whole idea of Glenn and Wendy not being able to have a child, but wanting to have a child um, was really just a folk tale conceit. It's like a classic, you know, the king, the king and queen aren't able to have a child. So the, they go to the witch and the witch gives them, you know, so on and so forth. Um, that's where, that's how that came together. How do you feel about, you know, I mean, just just with this focus on process and publication and what what is it like for you that curses is going to come back into print in this way that that work from that time period coming back into print now do you have any any feelings about that or or thoughts that kind of relate to what you've been talking about today uh not not really i mean of, of course like It's, you know, it's nice to be in print. Um, I'm proud of that work. Um, while at the same time, like, you know, I did that stuff right out of college. And so it's almost like it was like sort of my like, you know, grad school material or something where it's like, um, uh, I see a lot of the, <laughs> like, like I can't, let's just say I, I can draw a little bit better now. Um, the the thing I'll say is, and so when I was going to look into it, I was like, I was afraid that I was going to like, it was going to be like bad. And I was going to look at it and I was going to be like, oh, this is like, you know, like I feel worse and worse about myself or about my work. But for whatever, you know, for whatever it's worth, whatever it's worth, when I was looking through the material, like I, I tapped into a kind of comics making energy that I had forgotten that I forgotten about. And so for me, at least personally, going through all those old folders and looking for things to put in the notes and going through the pages and, you know, fixing all the little um, screw ups and stuff, um, typos and so forth was very like energizing for me and inspiring for me personally. So I, I was, I was re-energized. Danny Fingeroth says, um, just what you've shown us in the slideshow is an astonishing body of work, both in quality and quantity. 
I assume you've considered and decided against compiling an annotated version of this stuff. You seem to have a sort of focus, just maybe not what you might realize it as. Am I totally off here? Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I always feel like I'm not doing anything, but then when I when I go through a lot of the stuff, um, I end up, you know, I'm like, oh, I forgot about all this stuff. I'm definitely out ahead of myself way too much where I'm trying to like, I'm trying to both like take material that's already done and like get it into print so that it's like not just on a hard drive for sure. Um, but that's very nice of you to say, thank you. Um, this is a, uh, on the left here, this is also a thing. I didn't really get a chance to talk about this, but I also went through a period where I was like, I would take giant pieces of paper and I would try to just do all the thinking and to-do lists and so forth on the one big piece of paper, thinking like, at least I'm just looking at this one big piece of paper uh, every day and that'll help me organize my thoughts. But, you know, again, I would go through those so quickly that um, after a while I was like, what am, again, it was like, what am I doing? What am I doing with this? Like, am I gonna put this in print? Am I gonna, you know, I can put it in the easing uh, for Patreon, but um, I didn't know what to do with it otherwise. And there's a lot of those, I, you know, it's like, I could have put a ton of those into the slideshow, but again, they're all in the external hard drive too. Samuel says, um, can you talk a little more about avoiding using the tricks of movies in comics? It strikes me as somewhat odd, given I've heard of filmmak filmmakers trying to use tricks in comics and films. Uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again. It strikes me as somewhat odd, given I've heard of filmmakers trying to use tricks in comics in films. Is it because of misguided parallels people tend to make because of certain shared qualities that are different? Is it reactionary? Does this extend to other art forms like music, painting, literature, et cetera? I mean, my feeling is only like, um, you know, I don't care what anyone does. Like, it's totally fine if you want to do, if you want to do a comic, but then like use a lot of cinematic approaches. It just seems to me sometimes, and I see this when I read comics, it seems to me like sometimes that we've been so trained by the constraints of, of how movies and TV happen. So like it's cheaper, it's very cheap to just like have characters in a room talking to each other and like wear the same clothes all the time because then you don't have to wardrobe changes, you don't jump around in time, you don't have special, you know, and so sometimes when I see a comic and it's just, it's just, it's just like a TV show or a movie and you, and the way that a TV show or a movie is, is because of all kinds of budgetary constraints or like constraints on how a physical photo, you know, like not a photo shoot, but like a film shoot, you know what I mean? Cutting those corners, like don't cut corners in comics that they cut those corners in TV or, you know what I mean? Like, don't do it. Like, like use comics. Comics can, you know, you can do all kinds of things. You can, you can do all kinds of things, whatever your imagination, you know, it's that, it's that kind of thing that I, I react to sometimes with comics where, but again, who can, you know, I also like, don't care. Like if you, if someone's like, I want to do a comic and I want it to just be like, straightforward like a tv show you know hbo tv show or something like that of course those are great and it's going to be a great comic just because it's drawn and it's it's frozen in time all this stuff you know so that's my feeling i it's it's very funny because we had this we had ben catcher and gary groth in conversation and and i'm very interested in what i perceive as a shift between the very early comics maybe lionel feininger's work and then uh, Milton Kniff's influence, which is so much more cinematic. And I, I feel that that influence has been, Kniff's influence has, has just taken over to this degree that we don't even perceive. And so I was asking Ben about it. And ben, and I was like, what about comics that explore themselves, do what only comics can do, that don't cut corners? Like, as you say, that don't cut corners. 
And Ben was saying, oh, you know, the idea of pure comics, that's so ridiculous. I see this as a form yeah. that's close to theater or something like that. And I didn't, that's an interesting way of his response. Um, but I, I kind of wonder maybe with your students, what you see, because like when I, when I see students, it's like some of them still seem to be working with that film TV mindset, but for some that seems completely irrelevant. And I'm wondering maybe what you see. Yeah. I, I just think it's what the, what the, it's like the limits of your imagination and what you're, approach if you're thinking like oh i'm doing i'm doing um like an you know i i think a lot of students are uh, really um influenced by manga and anime and then that's a sort of a, a similar thing where like anime and manga have a similar situation where like there's it's not constraints and it's not really cutting corners but it's like they're, they do certain things a certain way because of the way, you know, it's like the economic pressures and the production schedule pressures and like what you can actually get done and like whether you have uh, assistance or you don't have assistance or whether like it's very difficult to like animate a certain kind of thing versus a different kind of thing. Like that, over the years, those have kind of like built up certain like shorthands of storytelling it's fine it's all fine you know and I, again it's not really a, either it's not really an argument about pure comics or modernism or like pure forms or anything like that either it's just like saying like don't you know you can do all kinds of interesting things um if anything i think i'm thinking about literature i'm thinking about like you know, imaginative literature, I'm thinking it's about science fiction even, or like experimental writing, where it's like, you can do all kinds of crazy things with, you know, words and um, pictures and diagrams, etc. Speaking of your students, Tom Galambos, uh, Galambos says, thank you for this, Kevin. How much of your own subject interest, mental processes and memories, bleeds into your students' work? Do you find them also creating comics with a meditative disposition? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't know. The, I'm definitely not like trying to, I'm not trying to turn out little versions of myself. And I, and even if I were trying, I'm, just, I'm not succeeding. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I saw the, you know, you were talking about, you were doing a strip about Wimpy and I was like trying to think like other times, comics that I know that are important to you. I remember you did a strip about Floyd Godfordson and newspaper strip cartoonists. Your project to me seems so unique from what they're doing. I can see maybe a mode of drawing that might be similar. Um, you just mentioned literature as an influence. I'm kind of wondering who in the world of comics or, or graphic art, you know, I think of your work as having something in common with Saul Steinberg, maybe, because I see Steinberg as documenting things in his brain, how his mind is moving, things like that through the process of drawing. But I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering who might be figures like that for you within the world of, of uh, visual art and specifically cartooning. That's Beyond it's very kind of you and it's a big stretch to say that you see any Steinberg, but uh, I don't know. I, you know, um, I mean, I, he was hugely influenced by Chris Ware. I was hugely influenced by John Porcelino. Uh, I was hugely, I'm mean, hugely influenced by the idea of newspaper comics from the earliest 20th century. Um, it's kind of, that's kind of my ideal. Like I think of, I think of what a cartoonist is as someone who is drawing at least like a strip a day plus a Sunday on the weekend. <laughs> to me, that's like, if you could like, that's, to me, that's like sort of the peak performance. And it's what I think of like, like you can't really go beyond that. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I think um, yeah, 
yeah, there are huge influences on me. And then there's so many, so many cartoonists who are favorite cartoonists of mine, um, who I, you know, I'm just, uh, I take so much energy from their work and I can only hope to like give some back. I wanted to, you might think this is a silly question, but I went, before we started recording, I was showing you these zines that I was going to show to the screen and you were like, oh yeah, that's so long ago, simpler times. And I'm kind <laughs> of wondering what you, I, I, I don't mean in terms of just life in general being simpler when you did these, but in terms of what you thought about with your projects for comics, maybe when this issue came out versus where you've at, where, where you're at now, what is maybe what what did you want to do with the form at this time what were you trying to do with it and and what's changed over it's it's been quite some time and and you've you know i mean it's you've you've really committed to i see a trajectory from this to what you're doing now uh, that i think a lot of people who have followed your work from this time see but it's also changed in an unimaginable degree as well um so i'm i'm kind of wondering if you if your initial reaction to seeing this is simpler times, what what might the shift be for you as the artist who makes these things? When I when I was saying simpler times, I kind of meant this thing I was saying earlier, where I was just focused on one issue at a time, or really two issues at a time, and that I wasn't like I didn't have all these little side projects or side bodies of work, and I also was not getting like hired by someone to do something um and so um that's kind of what i meant uh but I, it's yeah it's probably the same sort of stuff i'm still like flailing around and like trying this and trying that and uh i mean sometimes when i look at older stuff i i just see i'm repeating myself in lots of ways <laughs> Or like I have an idea and then I think it's a new idea, but then I see in the sketchbook that it was an old idea that I'm just having again. Um, this strip on the screen right now is like a, a strip that's gonna come out soon for um, in Victory Journal, uh, which is like a fancy expensive uh, sports magazine um, with beautiful photography and so forth. Um, The um, the connection here is that, like in those days, I wasn't really asked to do that much. Um, and so I was just focused on what I wanted to do. And really the only thing I was able to, you know, and for a while I was screwed up in my head where I was like, when someone else would ask me to do something, I, I would like, I'd be like, I'd get mad because I'd be like, I want to do something for someone else, but I wouldn't, I would think I'd have to do whatever they wanted me, it, so on and so forth. The, the point being like now, if I do something for someone else, I try to make it something that I can put in my book later. And like, you know, this will end up in the Glenn Ganges serial that I'm working on. Like I, I did this story about fast pitch softball, but I'll just, I'll just weave it into the, you know, now I think of it really just that I'm, I'm trying to just do the one thing, which is fielder which is Glenn Ganges comics and whatever I else I do it's got to sort of somehow be connected you know through some some connection well maybe we could wind things up by I could ask you a question about you know I came to your work through self-publishing now um I would assume that you've made a choice with fielder to self-publish it you could have probably found a way to to have it come out from a publisher in some kind of way. Um, can I ask maybe what you're thinking of is, I mean, you've continued to self-publish constantly, but Fielder seems like maybe you're, you know, less of a zine project, more of your main project. Um, can I ask what the thinking process behind deciding to self-publish it is and, and what you feel about getting work like that out today that isn't in book form? Well, I, you know, I self-published Ganges 5, Ganges 6, and then Fielder 1. And I sort of self-published them on the model of what Sammy Harkham did with Crickets, um, which is, you know, 
self-published, but then either Fanographics or Drawn and Quarterly kind of helps with the distribution. Like that's the only way that it, it's possible. Um, if I had to also help, if I also had to like list it in the distribu distributors myself and do all that kind of thing, it wouldn't really be possible. And really the, the decision to self-publish is a decision to take on a bunch of emailing and, and headaches for like, for like to make maybe like 30% instead of 10%. <laughs> like that's it. That's the whole decision. You know, that's the whole uh, cal calculation is like, do I want someone else to do it? And I make 10% of the cover price or do I do a lot of the work myself and then I make 30% of the cover price. And that's it. And, and I believe me, I like every time I'm like, I don't know if it's worth it. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. I mean, it's, I think if you, some people have a gift for it and have like a, a spirit for it, but I, I struggle with it. And I, I would rather, I think I'm, I'm really coming around to would rather just like get the work done and send it out and focus on the next issue rather than focusing on the, you know, the shipping, uh, shipping numbers and so on and so forth. DR Lear, Lear asks, um, you process and virgil, verbalize so much to, uh, your process and, and verbalize so much to apply to your education job. I wonder if you look at teaching as a calling and what it brings to you. Uh, do I te look at it as a calling? I don't know. That's a kind of a freighted question uh, coming, from, coming from a religious background, too. Um, I don't know. I like to talk about comics. I know a lot about comics. It seems... Uh, Seems like um, if someone's going to pay me to stand stand up and talk about comics, I'll do it. Um, I don't think that I'm gifted necessarily in like having good relationships with students where I'm like, where I'm really like helping them shape their work. It's a little bit more like I'm info dumping a lot of, you know, material and then like, we're doing our best to like produce comics by the by the end of the semester you know um that being said like i you know it's it's a it's comics is a for me is like a life pursuit it's like a, the life you know it's like it's not just um it's not just like um drawing spider-man or or because you're a fan of it or something like that but it's like a it's like a um, it's like a, to use art school language, it's a practice. I, in, in my mind where it's like, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle where you're like, you're sitting at the desk, you're drawing all the time. You're trying to process the world through like a repeatable cartoon language. You're, you know, you're look at the world sort of ironically with a sense of, you know, sort of hopefully a sense of humor, uh, it's all part of a thing. And so, um, and I also think that if these students are like committed to the life, I hopefully will help them like avoid some of the like mistakes I made along the way or like give them some advance like sense of like um, some of the things they're in for later that might help later. Well, I actually think that's, oh yeah, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I think Sit that's up straight, actually, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's actually a really beautiful note to end things on. You answered, a, I, I think I, I always, um, you're a cartoonist I've been reading for so long. And I do think it's, I always have a hard, I, I don't have a hard time reacting to your work, but verbalizing things about it are very, very hard for me personally. And, um, it's been beautiful to to hear you talk about it and and answer these questions. And I I, I thank you so much for your time and for for participating in this, Kevin. Yeah, thanks everybody for paying attention and good questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone in the audience for your questions. And um, I should say next week uh, we will have Juliet Calais as our guest. It will be um, online the same way that this has been, so you can register that way. But it will also be live and in person 
in Brooklyn at Unnameable Books. So if you're in New York, you can attend that. Um, you can just show up to Unnameable Books uh, uh, at seven o'clock and, and participate in it live. Um, so thank you all so much. And thank you, Kevin. And see you guys next week. Bye for now. Thank you.